we're not having way. Um, so uh, I, I want to state that this is the Youth Education and Cultural Fest Committee of the Community Board Two that were being recorded for public access in accordance with the open meeting laws that we conduct remote meetings with the community uh, for the, the committee members cameras on and, and we encourage the other participants to have their cameras on. Uh, we encourage people to keep their microphones muted when not speaking. Uh, if there is, when there is discussion or any voting, I'll make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members and board members and the public. Uh, if there are questions that fall outside of public comment, uh, welcome to the chat and we will address them. And we're committed to access for all of our neighbors um, without limitation. Uh, so now we have the roll call for our committee. So I'm Betty Feibush. Santia, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Santia Policia. I am a committee member and board member. And I see Madison. Madison. I am Madison Chang, committee member and board member. Great, welcome and fabulous uh, secretary. Can you see if there's anyone else from our committee who's on this call? Dorothy uh, oh. is on the call. Oh, okay, hi. Please hi. introduce yourself. Dorothy Thompson Manning, I'm the uh, co-chair of the committee. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so um, you've uh, received the agenda in the uh, email. It, are there any objections to the agenda or are we approving it as written? Okay, there are no objections. So uh, the agenda is approved. And the minutes of February 22nd, uh, I was not at the meeting. Thank you, uh, Dorothea, for um, the leadership in that meeting. Um, is there any discussion about the minutes or can we approve it by consensus? Okay. So the uh, minutes will be approved by consensus of the people who are here, even though there isn't a quorum. Okay, so we have a presentation tonight. We're very excited. The children's, um, the committee, the citizens. Excuse me, uh, excuse me, Betty. Sure. Um, we have our youth people. Aren't they supposed to introduce themselves also as members of the committee? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, so who do we have here? Let me see. Abby? Hi, I'm Abby. I'm a youth council member. Great. And Ian? Hello, I'm Ian. I'm also part of the youth council. Welcome. And Maddie? Hi, I'm Maddie, and I'm part of the youth council. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dorothea. And we will be asking our youth council um, to chat in the part where we talk um, for, uh, the community. Um, committee business. Okay, so uh, we have a presentation, an in-depth robust presentation about the state of uh, early youth services in, in our community. That's the children who many of them are not yet served by the public schools. In many of our meetings, we talk about uh, our students in the, the, the district schools and the charter schools. And it's important to think about the children's care and education before they get um, to the formal schooling. So uh, we have Maria and Alice from CCC. We'll listen to their presentation and then we have time for uh, in-depth question and discussion. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I think Maria is going to pull up uh, our, our presentation. Yes. Um, and we'll us. we'll have a few spots throughout to have questions um, just because it is, as as was said, robust. So there's there's some, a lot of data in there. So it, we'll, we'll pause at a couple of places just to see if people have questions and, and then we can have space at the end too. 
Um, so I, I'm happy to get started and just um, sort of introduce you to Citizens Committee for Children. Um, I'm Alice Bufkin. I'm our Associate Executive Director of Policy and Advocacy, and I'll let Maria introduce herself before I jump in. Uh, thanks, Alice. My name is Maria Drabnik, and I'm Senior Research Associate for Data uh, at the CCC. I'm a four-member team and happy to present here and answer any questions throughout or after via email. You will have our email addresses at the end of the presentation. Thanks. So we're happy to, to join you, I think, before we get into the, the subject of today's conversation, which I think in addition to the early care and education piece, um, we also were asked to sort of present on some issues around infant maternal health, which we're happy to do. Um, you'll note that there's also a reference to early intervention, just in terms of kind of keeping everything in within the, the um, number of slides. We are happy to talk about EI, but we're going to sort of focus on the EC, the early care and education component, but happy to answer some questions about our work around early intervention. Um, so I'll do a little bit of an overview of who CCC is very briefly. Maria is going, going to provide a little bit of information on our, our research, as well as our database, which I think some of you may be familiar with. Um, and then we'll dive into some of the data around um, early care and education, infant mental health, as much as we can, specific to your particular um, area, and then uh, talking about some of the sort of policy considerations as well. So uh, with that, um, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of CCC for those who aren't familiar. Um, we are a multi-issue children's advocacy organization. We've actually been around since 1944. Um, and our ultimate goal is to ensure that every child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Um, and we accomplish that mission through what we view as three primary pillars. So we um, have our research and our, our data branch where Maria is part of, I should set a four, uh, uh, four person team. Um, and that is, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and she will do a deeper dive in a moment into sort of some of the, the types of, of research and data that we do to, to sort of, again, drive our support for children and families across a host of issues. We also do civic engagement. So we have a youth leadership council. Um, we have a, a you know, a, a group of um, uh, adult uh, advocates. Um, we do a number of trainings throughout the year. We really seek to engage um, both young people and adults in sort of learning about the process of advocating, of, of helping um, um, develop priorities that they want to focus on of, you know, holding events and doing community outreach like events like this um, to really engage people in, in the work as much as possible. And then our third pillar is, is the one I'm a part of, which is our advocacy and policy work. So we do city and state level advocacy around a host of issues that impact kids and families from um, childcare to health, to mental health, to youth justice, to um, behavioral health, to um, you know uh, economic security, food insecurity. We, we touch a lot of different areas of the city and the state level. Um, and Maria, if you'll jump to the next slide. Um, I don't wanna spend too much time going to how we do our Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I um, don't want to spend too much time going to, to how we do our advocacy, but I'll just say a lot of it is in collaboration with coalitions, is really working with um, whether it's families, whether it's providers, whether it's educators, stake, different stakeholders throughout the city and the state, we wouldn't absolutely be able to do the work we do without being collaborative with those who are on the ground and those who are sort of working with, with communities throughout the city and the state. Um, so happy to answer more questions later on, but just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of kind of who CC is before I turn over to Maria to talk a little bit about our data. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so I have two slides about our online database, and there is a slide also about other publications that we produce either annually or other every two years. Uh, I will not do a live demo now, but if we have time at the end, if there is interest, I can. But for now, I would like to show you just that on our online database, there are like several components. One is uh, called Explore Data. So on that, on that kind of part of the site, I, I kind of have a outline of all of the indicators under early care and education. It's around 15 indicators. Each one has breakdowns by setting or by age or by kind of different characteristics. So it's like more than 40 just on early care and education. Uh, while you're there, like you're able to view the data as a map, which can be community district, uh, zip code, uh, borough, citywide, it depends. It can be also school district. It depends on the data. You can view the data as a table. You can view data as a bar chart. So it can be a really easy way to just take a screenshot and use it in, in the reports. And I think I used some of this uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. And on this next slide, I just kind of I'm highlighting the community asset mapping tool on the database that has uh, 
several dozen of indicators across different domains. So here I have a screenshot of, uh, of some of our education site level data. Like these are mainly about uh, early care and education, but you can find also data like on banks, public transportation, medical facilities, libraries, um, food support sites, etc. So you're able also to download all of these data uh, in Excel file uh, with coordinates. Also the, the data on Explore is available to like in Excel files, but you can also download the image screenshot or share the data via email, Facebook or Twitter. So I will pause here on this on the, on the database and maybe come back to it uh, once we're done. And on this slide, it's more like to have it uh, as, as, uh, as a just a reference point. Uh, this is our annual, like it's not really annual. We produce keeping track of New York City's children every two years. The next publication is about to come uh, at the end of April. So we are producing it at the moment. So you will probably see updates uh, from us on that. We produce every year child and family well-being index. Uh, we also have community-based assessment. We've done four in four different different communities in the city. One was Brownsville, Northern Manhattan, also in Staten Island, and Corona in Jackson Heights. It was done before the pandemic started. And we have a infographics and blog post on like a host of issues. So this is all on a CCC's main site, uh, while the database is all, is like on a separate platform. So I will pause here just for any questions about CCC overall or about data uh, before I dive into early care and education data. Okay, I'll move on. So here in the title, I kind of try to really outline uh, CCC, as Alice said, like we are deeply, like we are deeply involved in advocacy on cost of issues. Early care education is one of them. And I'm highlighting the key takeaways from the citywide data, comparing it to the community board to more to like drive your attention and kind of just uh, make you more familiar with like how we are thinking and how we are using data to connect with advocacy and actually to support the advocacy. So, I'm not sure how much you are familiar with the early care education systems. So I have this kind of overview slides just to tell you briefly. When we say early education, we think about different types of settings. Traditionally, these were centers, community-based organization centers that, that provide group child care. Uh, there are also home-based uh, settings where fewer children are served and there is usually one or two uh, teachers who are licensed to, to provide the care. Care can also be provided in schools, especially now with expansion of pre-K and 3K. And also care can be provided by friends or neighbors. And I'm saying this uh, and you will see how that ties into funding. Funding also can be universal. As you might know, there was like a huge expansion of pre-K and 3K in the past couple of years. So this care is free, which means that when families are applying, they don't have to provide proof of income. They can just apply. And it, it is provided in centers, in school, and some of it is provided in home-based care. Uh, subsidized care was, is actually the type of child care that was here historically, either through vouchers that families are getting so that they can use it at any centers, including they can use it with their friends or neighbors uh, to kind of pay for the care. And there is also early learn contracted side of the subsidized care, which are centers or home-based care contracted with the city to uh, provide care for children under five. So in some way, we have now this universal free care building off of this historically subsidized care. And I also have this uh, one box on private fee-for-service care. Many families are not able to access uh, any form of, of uh, subsidized care or they have children who are infants and toddlers. So there is no universal option for them. This data, like on this care, is not captured by our data on our database. So we are specifically focusing on publicly funded care. We do have interest in understanding the like broader spectrum. However, the public available data is really not available. Uh, even, even the one on public, on public data, we have to ask like agencies like the Department of Education. We are making ask for specific data, getting it and then putting it, making it available on our database. In a similar way, we were doing for several years now ask with the Administration for Children's Services because they publish data only citywide. So we ask for the site level data and then we aggregate it by community district or zip code and have it available on a database. 
So I'm just kind of making that note. And I think I already mentioned different programs. So there is pre-K and 3K, there is Head Start, which kind of falls under this uh, subsidized domain. And childcare is more broadly, which uh, like in these subsidized uh, settings, when you have a group, they childcare, uh, traditionally before pre-K and 3K, it was just called like that, but it wasn't part of the Head Start program. And I will also say there are some centers that provide Head Start, Head Start and they're not contracted through the city, but directly with the federal government. It's a smaller share, but uh, public available data is not, uh, is not available and we were not able to obtain it. So that is not captured either, but we are planning to obtain that. So that's, it was a lot on this side. So come back, ask me any questions or clar clarifications. So I will move on to kind of more broader pictures. Picture citywide, we have over 500,000 children under five. So you can see on this left side, almost a half of them are in households under 200% of the federal poverty level. And we call them low, in, low income households. We are using this threshold because that is the income threshold that uh, families need to be like below in order to apply for the subsidized care. And then we have around 127,000 children enrolled in publicly funded system. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that these 127, they're not all income eligible. So these are families, uh, children in households of different incomes because pre-K and 3K don't have income eligibility tied. But I think it's a good as a, as a snapshot. And I pulled the data for uh, community district two and we see similar distribution around 10,000 children under five, 2,300 in households under 200% uh, of poverty, and around 1,200 children enrolled in publicly funded system. So we are talking about small number of children, but I think uh, it's important to really understand what is happening and also to see uh, like what is the need or kind of think about the need in that way. <clears throat> On this chart, I'm showing citywide data and here are like children broken down by age groups on the left side. So we have around 211,000 infants, 106, uh, like 100,000 toddlers, and here are three-year-olds and four-year-olds. This top part is showing this around 127,000 enrolled in public system. And we can see that majority are four-year-olds and three-year-olds. Only tiny share of infants is enrolled in publicly funded system and also tiny share of toddlers. So we can think about out of all 500, thousand children uh, in the city, around 400,000 are not captured by the public funded system. And we are not saying that all kids would need to be uh, accessed, would uh, have to be in a care. Uh, there are different choices that families are making that are not like having child in a child care, but I think it's uh, a good point. And I think on this side, the, on this slide, I put some data for your community district. And I can just kind of say briefly, on the left side, we see children under five enrolled in public system by age. Majority of them are four-year-olds. In your district as well, of those 1,200 children, uh, over 800 are four-year-olds. So these are four-year-olds in pre-K settings. And also if we uh, kind of think about the settings uh, citywide, we see that children are mainly served in centers, 64,000, and in schools, 37,000. You might know that uh, DOE also have uh, pre-K uh, classrooms in these standalone D DOE pre-K centers, uh, which are made typically in like public schools, but there are no other grades. So like you, you can have a center of like 20 pre-K classrooms. So those ones are under schools. It, like in a way that I broke the data, these kind of DOE large centers are captured under schools. And in fourth green, you see similar distribution. The majority of children are in schools or in community-based centers. So I think I mentioned, or maybe I didn't, but I will say it here. Here I'm focusing on contracted system. And what I call contracted system is really pre-K, children in 3K and early learn. So in 2020, early learn was like subsidized. Uh, is, is it was and it's it still is uh, like providing care for, like which is income tied to income 
eligibility and other criteria. Traditionally, it was administered by the Administration for Children's Services, but in 2020, it transferred to the Department of Education under birth of five system for children under five. So all of these, these three now segments are actually called contracted and they're all under the DOE. And I'm kind of showing over time, there was like a huge expansion, mainly driven by expansion in pre-K starting 2014-15. So like in 2012-13, we had around 33,000 children in contracted care. So this doesn't capture children using vouchers. And in 2019-20, we are up to 92,000. And this sliver in pink in the middle is expansion of 3K, which started with 824 children, moved to 3,000 and... Uh, all three-year-olds that are that were traditionally in early learn settings are kind of transferred and are now called 3K. So we see a decrease on a, of a great part of the chart and kind of expansion here. So we have 17,000 in 2019-20, and they're also announced this expansion of 3K in the next couple of years. So there are a few things that we are really trying to draw attention uh, in our policy and advocacy, and Alice will talk more, but I want to show you some data. So you saw that infants and toddlers are like that small, smaller kind of sliver of the pie uh, of all children in publicly funded system. And here we are breaking them down of all, of all 20, 211,000 uh, infants in New York City. Uh, more than half are not income eligible. It means they're above 200% of the federal poverty level, but 93,000 uh, of them are in income eligible households. And we have close to 8,000 enrolled. So 91% of them are not enrolled. And probably with infants, it's really like the time that parents probably would like to stay with their children or making different choices, having them with family members, but having just like 9% uh, is not is not like something that we think is uh, is equivalent to the need. And my son who is here, six year old is making the noise. So Adam, please stop. Uh, on this side, we have uh, around 106 toddlers and kind of similar in distribution, but we do have around 14,000 toddlers in publicly funded systems. So we are drawing the attention to, to, to this data. And I have a link here for the indicator on online base. <clears throat> and this data is are available by Bora. We did not break them down by community district, even though we would like to have it up there. But it is, it is because of estimates. We are using uh, American community survey data to estimate the population. So we, we are breaking down by infants and by toddlers, and then uh, going down like on a community district level, we have cases that really we cannot say with confidence that this is a number of infants in that community district. So we kept the data citywide and borough-wide. And there is another advocacy point that uh, we are advocating at the moment and kind of want to think, uh, want public to, to, to think more about. There was this huge expansion of pre-K and 3K, but a majority of the seats added are school day uh, seats, school year. It, it means 6 hours and 20 minutes a day without that after school uh, after school portion covered and 180 days a year and we know for working families that is not covering your whole day and your whole year we also have sites that provide full day year-round care and those are the sites that kind of historically provided care like under that early learn system centers and they're there like eight to ten hours a day uh, almost entire year open for families so we see over time that uh, school day, school year number of seats increased while the full day year round care decreased. While we are very happy with pre cantric expansion, we want to say we need more of that kind of full day care. And here we are not even talking about uh, care for families who don't work traditional hours, like people in other industries that kind of need to really care uh, later in the evening or just kind of cannot fit into that nine to five schedule. And uh, in, on the map, you, you can see the distribution of children under five in full day year-round care. So basically all these districts that are kind of yellow, they have mainly school, school uh, day slots and really not that many uh, full day slots. And I think I pulled some data for your district on this. So you can see uh, citywide 25% of all uh, contracted enrollment is in full day slots in Fort Green, Brooklyn Heights, it's 29. 
So that means that you probably have more of, more of the seats in these centers that provide uh, this type of care. And also we see that school day, school year is in line with the citywide average. And you have a map here. And as I said earlier, pre-K enrollment is driving uh, like entire contracted system. So on the database, we also have length of care within pre-K and also within 3K. So here is the map included and you have the link as well. And I will spend minimal time on this and I can come back to it after and uh, answer any questions, but just for the sake of time overall, we did produce the analysis in 2019 on cost burden and affordability. So we would like to, we wanted to see like, uh, use the data the, on, a, on estimate of, of a cost for center-based annually and for home-based and compare that to median incomes and see what is that childcare cost burden in a similar way that we are thinking about um, rent burden in a housing. And we see that citywide 31% of median household income for all families with young children is, co is consumed by center-based care. And this is assuming that family only has uh, one child in care. And this is focused, uh, actually I forgot to say, on infants and toddlers because different prices are for infants and toddlers versus like older children. And affordability is another measure that we developed, which is really saying that what is the share of families with at least one child under five years of age for whom care would cost no, no more than 7% of their household income, a threshold like established by the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we can see that 93% of families with young children cannot afford center-based care. So it's really unaffordable for families across all income spectrums. And you will see that on the next few slides. <clears throat> on the left side, I'm demonstrating a uh, childcare cost burden by different household types for home-based, which is cheaper and center-based. And we see for all families, let me just see, uh, for all families, like 31% that cost burden is there, 17% of, the, of them would be burdened by home-based care. And on the left side, I'm showing that affordability map. So this is affordability of center-based care by community district. And uh, Darkest blue is like zero to 3%, which means within each of these community district between zero or 3% uh, are able to afford. And we see that in Manhattan, we have higher share of families who kind of would uh, consider care affordable, but it is because of really high median incomes in these communities. So it's, it's really driven by that. Maria, could I ask you a quick question? Sure. So based on the coloring of the map on the right, this indicates that Brooklyn Community District 2 is actually on par with Midtown Manhattan as far as affordability of center-based care. It is, uh, it is, it is within this category of 22 to 35 percent. Uh, I can pull on a database, but I, it is, and I think it's really, it's probably driven by probably higher incomes in certain parts of the community. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One second. And here I uh, pull some data as a comparison between your district and the city as a whole. So I think here we see, <clears throat> uh, so the first bar is all families, married couples and single parents. So as we, I think we said cost burden for all families around 30%. We can see that cost burden in your district is kind of lower uh, than citywide, which is I think driven by incomes. But also we see that for single parents in your community, 81% uh, of their income would be burdened by center-based care which is higher than like citywide average. And I want to say citywide average is good to know, but I think it definitely skews a lot of differences across different geographies. So uh, it's more telling to focus on the individual districts. And as you mentioned, like on affordability side, we see that uh, childcare seem to be more affordable across all families, married couples uh, compared to the citywide and also for single parents. And I think with this, I kind of concluded the data piece. I can answer any question that kind of pertains to data before I hand it off to Alex. Or you can think about it and come back to it after, yeah. Uh, let me ask a question. Um, what are you doing with this information? with this database, what is your organization doing with it? 
beside collecting it? Um, Absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, well, I'll say definitely there is a huge work on just collect, getting the data, collecting it, putting it on a database. But our really main goal is to have public use it. So we do work through our coalitions and different partners, service providers, foundations. So we are using the data to inform their, you know, their outreach programming uh, or any other planning that they are doing. So we are here just to, to present on a database, answer question, answer some more specific questions or pr produce subsequent, subsequent analysis. I think presentations at community boards is something we historically done a lot uh, because we would like to get the data done to, to the people. And may, maybe Alice, if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, I'll add, so I think there's the component of wanting, you know, the data on our database is publicly available. Anybody can use it. I think what, what we, do with this is we're doing some of the analysis that maybe is is harder to get just from the database. But one, we want that that data available, as Maria said, to communities so that they can use it to see where shortages are, where there are challenges with access, where different you know parts of communities are struggling to access services, whether it's early career education or any of the other things we look at. But then we also use this data for advocacy. And that's what I'll speak to in a minute is that we look at where these shortages are throughout the city and, and look at where these barriers are. And then we use that to, to support the work that we and our partners do to try to push for better investments and policies to help support things like early care and education and, and other areas. So I'd say those are the, the two pieces of wanting to use it for you know publicly available uh, communities to sort of access in different ways, as Maria said, and then also using it for advocacy. Okay, I'll wait to hear about the advocacy. Thank Maria, you. Maria, could you back up to the previous slide very quickly? Uh, 25 or maybe it was 26, maybe. No, it was this one, it was this one. Um, what stood out to me about this slide, sorry about the video. What stood out to me about this slide is that most of your previous slides indicated, and please tell me if I'm misinterpreting, that our district is actually performing about on par with the rest of the city. And this was the first slide that I really noticed, wow, that 81% single parents needing childcare as a cost burden, to me, that's where maybe the committee could start as, as they're crafting their statement of district needs. To me, this looks like a district need. Is that a correct interpretation? I want to say uh, yes. And I feel like if even if you explore the database and just see how it plays in other communities, cost burden may like imposed by childcare. And this is not a perfect kind of uh, formula just because we're assuming that every family has only, you know, one child in care, but definitely single parents really are experiencing really much higher cost burden. And you can see this like in your community district. There are some districts citywide where the cost burden is like 152, like compared to their income. So uh, it varies, but it, it probably means that I'm sure, I believe that families in the, these districts are not really using center-based care. They might be using family care. They might be using some forms of, many forms of informal care. But that is one. I would say maybe another uh, area, even though it's on par with the city, the citywide data, it doesn't mean it's uh, it's perfect or it's ideal. So maybe like is, even if you're thinking about uh, that there are like 10,000 children under five, around 2,500 in low income households and like half of those are in publicly funded system. So I think it is the area where these other 15, like 1,200 children enrolled, how they're accessing care, et cetera. But yes, I think 81% is a high cost burden. Thank you, this is so great. You're welcome. So maybe we um, happy to move on. If people, if you think of questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, and we can we can circle back around to them. Um, but I can move into talking a little bit about some of our advocacy around early care and education. So I'm going to focus primarily at the city level. We do do state level work, and I'll actually talk in a moment about some of the state. Um, proposals with the budget that are currently underway. Um, but a lot of our work is done through a campaign called the Campaign for Children, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, this is a coalition of 150 community-based organizations, direct service providers, advocates, um, and it really came together in 2011 when the former mayor Bloomberg threatened to cut childcare and after-school programs by for 47,000 children. So there was a real outcry against that, a real collective coming together to push back on that. And since then, this um, coalition has advocated to enhance supports for early care and youth services. 
Um, so uh, maybe if you want to jump to the next slide. Um, so I think when we talk about, I'm going to talk about sort of two aspects of, of the, the ECE space. One is the, the workforce, and the second is some of the steps that are needed, many of which Maria sort of outlined that are needed to get to sort of universal birth to pie. So we know that in our workforce, we have ongoing challenges with staff shortages, which contribute to lack of access. Um, you know, much of this is really driven by inadequate compensation for our childcare workforce. Um, and if we don't have places for families to go for early care, then we can't get to universal access. And as I think it's also important to note that New York City's early childhood workforce are primarily women, primarily women of color. So when we are talking about workforce issues, we're really talking about issues of equity as well. Um, so in 2019, some of you may know this, but the city committed to a path to parity for certified teachers and community-based organizations. So for those unfamiliar, you know, um, we have our providers who are funded through the Department of Education, and we have our providers funded through community-based organizations, and their salaries were widely different. And what that meant is we had a very unequal and equitable way that we were paying those of our providers doing very good work who happened to be providing it through one pathway and not the other. So there has been a multi-year push to have parity between um, uh, between salaries, between both uh, public school sort of teachers essentially and certified teachers and CBOs. And so we actually saw an enormous, you know, advance in 2019 when the, the city, you know, moved towards parity. Um, and so what that essentially did is it brought the salaries of a a community-based organization provider equivalent to the starting salary of a public school teacher. Um, so that's a big victory, but it didn't cover a number of folks. It didn't cover directors. It didn't cover those who are in, uh, provide preschool special education, who, as we all know, are often the um, you know most challenged in terms of needing additional supports, um, most underpaid, and so they were not included in salary parity. It didn't include support staff like janitors, like cooks, like other people who are working within the CBO settings, and didn't really account for longevity. So it didn't account for the fact that Yes, at the starting point, maybe we're equal, but are we accounting for as you're getting higher education levels, are you're getting more experience, are you still at the same, are you still getting paid equivalently to your counterpart at the Department of Education? So um, a lot of our work is around trying to actually address those um, uh, those, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but those who are essentially left behind in, in the, the agreement towards salary parity. And I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Um, Marie, if you wanna jump to the next slide. So, the the sort of key components are uh, around wanting to take steps to lay a foundation for universal birth to five. So as Maria said, New York City is ahead of most cities and or more maybe all cities in terms of getting us to certain focus on 3K on pre-K for all. But we know that that is not available for infants and toddlers and for those who are parents or have worked with parents. That is often the most uh, challenging period. That is when we need to have affordable or free um, uh, opportunities for, for early care. And, and so a big focus of our advocacy is wanting to expand access to infant and toddler seats. We also want to convert a lot of those 3K and pre-K seats to extended day or extended year. So that's what Maria was talking about, about how many of these hours are not either, they're not even uh, uh, they don't even meet what a full eight hour workday is, much less those who may have untradi may not have traditional hours that they're working, parents who are working outside of those traditional sort of nine to five hours. We also wanna extend it year round. So we're not just basing it on the school, uh, we're actually having year round access, as well as sort of looking at other uh, sort of flexible needs to have childcare options. We also wanna increase access to childcare vouchers and reduce the backlog of families on voucher lists. So we know that there is a, a wait list to be able to get a voucher in order to pay for childcare. Um, this one's a little wonkier, but essentially there's some challenges in enrollment. There's sort of everything is very centralized, which makes it a lot harder for providers to flexibly enroll um, uh, families uh, and, and get them into getting services. And a lot of the focus is on center-based care, but we know, as Maria pointed out in her data, a big, uh, a large amount of, of families are relying on family child care and home-based providers. So we need to make sure that they are um, they're accounted for and that we're expanding access to those options as well. And then the second component of this is what I was talking about previously around sort of the workforce. So making sure that we address those staff who were left behind, um, preschool special educators, uh, directors, um, support staff, um, and we want to additionally increase compensation for licensed family day care providers. So those are um, uh, sort of the key pieces at the city level. I'm gonna to touch on one um, a little bit on the state level real quick, and then I'll pause to see if people have questions. So Maria, if you wanna to jump to the next piece. 
So as you all may be aware, we are kind of nearing the very end of budget, budget negotiations at the state level. So very soon we're gonna have a, a state budget for this upcoming next year. And there are some really significant proposals in the, uh, the budget around childcare. So um, both the Senate and Assembly, essentially, as you may know, the governor has her version or in previous different governors, uh, her version of the budget. And then the Senate and Assembly come back and say, well, we actually want funding for more in this area you know, and, and here's here's our version of the budget. And then they all hash it out together to decide what's the budget actually look like. So right now the Senate and Assembly are both pushing for different versions, but essentially they're asking for a $3 billion investment into childcare for a range of things. Things like expanding subsidy eligibility to a higher uh, income level so that uh, more families would be able to access um, subsidies, subsidized um, childcare, um, increasing reimbursement rates so that it's closer to the market childcare rates so that we're able to have a more sustainable workforce, um, investing in childcare stabilization grants. So things like cleaning, like PPE, like mental health supports to really recognize those are supports needed by the workforce. And uh, actually, uh, in addition to things like bonuses for um, really uh, attracting and keeping uh, uh, providers um, uh, in, in particularly in parts of the, the city or the state that are really lacking access. So that right now, we don't know how that's going to play out. We'll know in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, but right now, I know our state, you know, we and, and many of our partner organizations at the state level are really pushing. Originally, we wanted $5 billion. We still want $5 billion, But the fact that even $3 billion is on the table, that's a huge amount of funding. And if we could get that through in the budget, that would be pretty transformative and, and could really have an impact on, on different parts of the state and access to childcare. So I'll just pause there um, and see if people have questions either on the, the policy piece or on the data part that Maria covered. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thinking about the 3K seats, and we've been aware that the 3K seats in our district have not been well enrolled. And part of it is, as you say, it's based on the school calendar and the school day and the vacations and holidays and summers. And it's, it's a lot for parents to manage. It's really just part time. And then how do you get the child from the school to auntie's house or wherever the child is going for the rest of the time? So are there specifics that you can help us think through, or maybe if not now, later, that for our district statement of needs, are we thinking about asking those 3K programs to be open throughout the year uh, in, in that setting or to have an easier way of, of children to get to be in two types of care? Uh, because we do believe that the 3K in, this, in the actual school may be of higher educational value. Yeah. So I think the, the focus has more been on the first thing you said, which is trying to get our city to provide funding in order to be able to have uh, providers be open outside of these current hours. So whether that's year round or whether that's outside of, you know, this, that six and a half, 6.2, six and a half hours a day. So that's really been the primary focus is saying, you know, mm -hmm. we've already got a great start in terms of having a city that is, uh, ostensibly committed to, to universal access. So we just need to put more, um, essentially identify, which we all know, and you laid out those areas where it's not actually helping um, parents because it's just it's not full day and actually putting in the money to, to extend either the hours or the, the year round uh, care. Um, because some of the reality is if, um, you know, providers have to keep their doors open so that we have to make sure that we're actually putting up enough funding so that they can in fact provide year round without um, you know, sitting through summer hours or something like that without actually having families have their children come in. And then, you know, how do they, if, if they're not getting paid for that, then then they have challenges staying open. So it's, it's really sort of addressing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Um, can you give me an example of the, um, I think you said it was the community-based organizations. Uh, what is the name of one or two of them? Sure. So, um, in terms of th this would just be just different um, daycares, essentially. So um, if, uh, you know, at the daycare council, for instance, is the association for um, uh, New York uh, daycares. And so if you're looking okay. just for a list of them, I think, I don't know if they- No, uh, I don't need it. I just wanted an example of uh, what you're referring to when you say a community-based um, organization. 
And I just wanted to have an idea exactly. Yeah, what, so yeah, so I, have like, here, uh, I'm sorry? I, should, I have it here on the screen. So I pulled up our asset mapping. Oh, great. And these are centers that mm -hmm. were traditional, like early learn. So like I'm here in your district and this is uh, Brooklyn Bureau of Community Services. It's like that sponsor name. And this is the name Duffield Children's Center. And this is uh, data, I think 2019-20. So you have all mm -hmm. enrollment, infants, toddlers, pre preschools, like etc. Okay. This one is okay. Strong Place Hope for Hope Atlantic, for example. And uh, so these were like originally contracted with the administration for still for children services. Children's services, okay. Yeah, and then we, then we got this hostel. So there were around three hundred centers citywide, mm -hmm. three hundred and thirty, through ACS no. early learn. And these are like new ones. So this is, I mean, there there are new ones in the city contracted system. So it means that there may be private centers, and for like infants, toddlers, or three year olds, traditionally you would pay. But then they have these pre-K classrooms. And now maybe, maybe they're having more 3K classrooms. So these are like, there are more of those. Northside Center for Child Development is one. This one is a school. Well, that, I don't need to know. Well, I because yeah. I have a couple of more questions and I don't want to spend too sure. much time because other people may have questions also. Now, for you sure. were talking about the infants and toddlers, about having a universal or an extended day for uh, daycare for them. Um, now, who's who's going to pay for this? So yeah, I mean, this is it. It really is about prioritizing what goes in the city budget. So um, it's about. I mean, I, I that's a separate side in terms of the revenue side. But are we talking about tax increases? Are we talking about rearranging where funding goes in the budget so that we're identifying kind of where we think the priority should be and that childcare, you know, is is a priority um, and they're. Some of it is identifying parts of the city budget that we maybe feel are less top priorities. And then some of it is also advocating at the state level and the federal level to try to get more funding that comes down to the city um, in order to support um, this. So, you know, there is, if some of you are following sort of what's happening, which fell apart, but <laughs> there are still ongoing negotiations at the federal level to try to pull down more funding um, for mm -hmm. things like childcare uh, statewide. So there's a potential for federal funding, there's a potential for state funding. And then there's also, you know, are we looking at revenue or, or um, redistributing some of the funding that we have in our city budget? Okay, and also about um, the certified teachers in the community-based organizations. Like you said, their salaries were brought up to the starting salary of teachers in public schools. How was that paid for? Uh, so the the state, I mean, the city budget um, essentially we had to increase the city budget and some of that was paid through for additional coming from, it comes from tax revenue. It comes from, um, you know, different revenue coming into the city and um, yeah, largely from that. And then uh, sometimes redistributing from where other, other places within the budget. Okay. So when they get together and decide uh, where the money, you know, how much money they have, it's a matter of maybe taking something from one area and putting it to another area that they feel would be uh, of the greater good, so to speak. Is that correct? Yeah, and and I'll say that for for the most part, you know, I'll say that we as advocates uh, tend to prefer finding ways to um, pull in more revenue so that the overall budget for the city is increased, rather than trying to make do with a smaller budget because we don't. Our stance, and I imagine the stance of many here, is we don't ever want to see money taken away from something that is equally valuable to families and kids. That's not mm -hmm. the goal. So I'm more thinking, you know, there's been some push around policing. There's been some push around like other places where funding could come from. Um, but there's also just the the idea of growing the budget rather than rearranging what's already there. And that would largely come from finding different revenue sources, like different taxation on higher incomes and things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll jump in. Hi, um, my apologies. I was late this evening. Uh, I really just want to say um, thank you. Uh, full disclosure, you know, what I do for a living are these um, contracts of, of youth programs. We have early childhood um, programs. So we are a CBO, Dorothea, to your question, you know, who runs some early childhood, 3K, pre-K. Um, I just want to thank um, you and your work with Citizens for Children. I know that without the mobilization and without the data, 
data is so key, right, to really move politicians. There, there's always sort of a, a backing behind children and families from a mouth, you know, from their mouths, but really the data seems to be really important. And then all the efforts to mobilize people in the field. Um, you know, I know so many middle school children would never have camp if it wasn't for the work you do. I mean, every summer that, you know, as many of us know, is just taken away and then it's a fight. Um, so just a, just a big thank you. It, it's so important what you do. Thank you. And Thanks for that. And we really appreciate that and would not be able to do it without also the voices of, of providers on uh, the ground who are sort of speaking to what they're doing. And you all probably saw, I just asked Maria if we have a seven o'clock stop, because I know we've already run quite a bit over um, probably what we were going to do. So I just wanted to, to time check because um, we have a section kind of on infant maternal health as well and some priorities there and, and data. So I just uh, want to get a sense of where, what should we plan for? <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. My sense is that you could be briefer on that part because we're not the health committee. So as it, as it, it's of course an overlap, but we're interested in, in young people, we're youth education and cultural affairs, but we're not dealing as much with the health side. Okay. So maybe Maria, that would be an opportunity for us to share this. We can... If, if you're okay with it, Maria, maybe um, I could provide like just a little bit of a overview of it and we could share out the slides that actually have the data at both the, the global level and the universal level. I mean, the and the community district level where we have it. Um, do you think that's the best way, Maria? Just... Uh, yeah, I feel like we only have a few slides in this uh, section. Yeah, so you, I feel like Alice, take it and condense it in a way that you feel like. Okay, so I mean, I, I think, yeah, let me, um, and I also, I know some people may have some additional questions, so. Um, well, we have access to these slides afterwards, so we can yes. really study them. Yeah, 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 we're happy to distribute those for sure. Thank you. Of course. Um, so I think, you know, given that this committee has less of a focus on, on informational health, I won't, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just say that, you know, as you are able to kind of look at the data, which we'll share out to you, um, you know, the city has made progress in reducing infant mortalities, but we have such a wide disparity in outcomes for uh, black babies and for, for black moms in particular, when it comes to maternal health and when it comes to maternal death and severe maternal morbidity, which is um, instances of, of you know, real high risk um, when, uh, when women are pregnant and when they're, they're uh, delivering. And so here Maria sort of put up over the, um, uh, sort of this triangle that shows you we have obviously the worst outcome is is maternal death, um, but severe maternal morbidity is is sort of many of the other conditions that occur um, that are, are real threats to to the the life of of the the, the person delivering and 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 are real issues that we want to address and are really just we often talk about maternal death as the tip of the iceberg because it's it's an indicator of so many other things that have not been provided so many supports that have not been there ac across the life of of a woman who who is pregnant and so the other other key thing to keep in mind is that you can look at the um, percent of total deliveries and percent of severe maternal morbidity cases. Um, you can see that for white women, although they are 35% uh, of deliveries, they're only 15% of severe maternal morbidity cases, whereas Black women are only 20% of deliveries, but represent 38% of the uh, cases of severe, severe maternal morbidity. So this is this is not unique to New York City, but this is a chronic issue. Um, this is something that has certainly caught the attention of many people in, in recent years. And we could spend a couple of hours talking about sort of the background behind it, about a lot of this is driven by racism within the healthcare system, but also uh, social determinants of health more broadly that are contributing to lack of access to healthcare, that are contributing to um, stressors on um, women of color in particular that are sort of driving a lot of these inequities. So there's both the piece of, a lot of the focus on the city has been on, uh, Maria, if you wanna to jump to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, um, a, bit more. a lot of the attention of the city has been on hospitals of so saying at that final stage, when a, when a woman is coming into a hospital and is um, going to deliver, are we making sure that we have you know, appropriate procedures? Are we looking at implicit bias? Are we making sure that we are supporting, identifying what the risks are to all women equally? Um, are we having 
what's known as standards for respectful care at birth. So making sure that uh, uh, pregnant people's needs are respected, that they have the supports that they need, that they're not being trampled over, that their rights are there. There's a there's a, a really great, um, and if you, you, you can Google it and find it, but like a really great sort of outline of what those standards should be. Now getting them implemented is another issue, but there is a lot of work around that piece. And that's very important. And a lot of the city and the state efforts are there. But I think we also have to keep in mind that that's the very last stage is when a woman is actually coming into a hospital and needs to get the right treatment. And that's critically important, but there's all these other things that have happened before in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of treatment and healthcare settings, in terms of, um, you know, uh, economic security, in terms of all these other things that need to be addressed holistically. So I think while I think we all know this, but but when we're when we're talking about healthcare issues, we also have to back up and talk about the whole context of a person's life and sort of what supports are needed. So they're all interconnected. Um, so I'll briefly touch on Maria. If you'll skip to the next slide. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just say that there are a few things happening at the state and city level right now. Um, there is in the budget again those budget negotiations. There's a push to ex to extend the period that Medicaid covers postpartum care. So you may know that if you have Medicaid and you come in and you deliver a child, you are only covered for 60 days postpartum, which is nothing. <laughs> um, really, it's nothing in terms of 60 days, two months after you've delivered a child. There's a push to extend that coverage up to the full year after the child is delivered, which would be huge. The proposal from the governor originally excluded undocumented immigrants, which obviously we we deeply opposed. So there's both the Senate, uh, actually largely the assembly is pushing back on that. And we hope that a version will get in that will support all people, uh, all immigrants included. Um, and there's a move to increase prenatal and postpartum care in Medicaid. At the city level, again, most there's a, the, the mayor has proposed adding money for family home visit, visiting programs, as well as some money for medical home and, and uh, obstetric simulation training. So again, that would be more in like a hospital setting and less kind of looking at sort of community factors. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide and then I will stop talking so we can get any final questions. Again, we'll share these slides with you. Happy to you know have a deeper conversation at this at another point. But um, a lot of work is still needed. So work around two generational models is really important. So work that engages not only the child but also the caregiver in the, the care that's provided, uh, whether we're talking about in a hospital setting or other settings. We wanna expand support for community health workers. Access health is one of those initiatives here in the city that are really designed to connect people to um, the care that they need from a community perspective. So it's actually having communities engaging people in access to, to the critical care they need, whether it's healthcare, whether it's um, you know connections to nutritional supports, whatever it is. We wanna strengthen support for community-based organizations that provide infant maternal health services. So again, a lot of the resources have gone to this, this looking at hospital practices, looking at some you know, our public hospitals, which are deeply under-resourced, and that's what the one of the items here is, we need to support public hospitals, particularly in communities that have traditionally been underserved, that have had poor quality healthcare, which are disproportionately in uh, low-income communities of color. There's a clear, you know, money, uh, you know, money matters. Where we put our money is a sign of our, our morals and our, our investment as a city and as a state. And we need to be putting that money in communities that have historically either faced discrimination or just don't have access to the quality of care they need. And part of that is our small community-based organizations, which again, are often very connected to communities in a way that some of our, our big um, organizations that are doing great work, but we wanna make sure that we're distributing that funding to those who are sort of on the ground in communities as well. Um, and we wanna expand access to things like reproductive health care, home visiting, group-based prenatal care, all these promising practices that are often not accessible. Um, support for community-based doulas and midwives. So some of you I'm sure are familiar with with doulas who provide um, sort of emotional support um, to uh, pregnant people, uh, both leading up to during and after pregnancy, after delivery. Um, and then also, this is actually the one that's a little bit off, but I just wanted to flag. CC does a lot of work with a, a coalition focusing on lead poisoning and other environmental risk factors. So that's obviously a little further down the line after you know you have the child, but um, but that's also another important piece to think about. Kind of what are the environmental factors that that can can really cause harm to young children? Um, I know I zoomed through that just because I wanted to make sure that we at least flag for you some of the the areas to consider. Um, but again, we're we'll, we're definitely happy to share the slide and and answer questions that you might have. So I'll just pause there. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the committee or uh, items for discussion? Uh, this is an amazing presentation. It gives us a lot, you know, to study and think about and, and so on. 
I, I can't see anyone else from the committee. Taya, can you um, see if anyone has a question? Uh, Ellis, no one from the committee has a hand up, but Ellis had a hand up earlier. Okay, great. Ellis, please. So um, actually, I, I want to thank you for the, uh, for the presentation. I mean, there was a lot in it. We could have talked about each slide, I think, like for 10, 15 minutes to really go deep. Uh, but what I heard after listening to the, to the earlier presentation, I'm not responding to this last piece, is that there's two big issues, uh, and that is citywide and in our own community. That's the issue of affordability for care. And, and, and what I called in my mind, good fit. And good fit is like, you know, when you need services from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. And, you know, like, even if we, even if uh, some of the public school sites get extended and, you know, offer longer services, more services, or we start doing that, there are still, um, families that cannot provide like the right fit at the right price point for their for, for the for the care that they need for the for the infants and toddlers and i'm wondering is there a place in in our city where people are doing that and are doing that well so there's a lot of flexibility you know i heard like before about issues with like uh you know, center-based programs, school programs need enrollment because often the money travels with the child. So are there any places where there's more flexibility around this inner city uh, that our community could kind of look at and get some ideas? Because it's great to um, articulate needs, but you also need to have a good idea about where you're going. Even if, if you're writing a statement of need, you need to have, you need to have a dream. Yeah. And so it where, you know, is there such a place or is that, you know? So Maria, I might ask you, but also Nicholas, I know you spoke up as a, I'm, I'm curious if you as a um, provider are, are familiar with any partners in the field that are doing this. And I might defer to Maria because she's a little more deep in the, in the specifics of, of um, specific practices. Uh, yeah, I can just maybe say briefly, and uh, I completely agree, through our community-based assessments, we hear this all the time, especially in communities where people are not in nine-to-five industries. And uh, like in some way, we are kind of struggling to even grapple with this portion of publicly funded, like even like to have eight hours and not six mm -hmm. hours. I feel like the partial, like, Part of the expansion uh, will be, a, especially in the 3K world, and I think it will be more in an infant and toddler kind of side, is really uh, utilizing more and home-based providers because I don't see city building more centers. Maybe yes, but I don't know if they can build that many centers uh, to kind of uh, cover the need. So maybe also these home-based providers could be an avenue for different hours of care like if providers are, are flexible. And I do agree it would kind of require us to do a review of like practices around the country. I don't have an answer now. I feel like I didn't get to do that, uh, but maybe if someone else has an idea or a thought and I can always follow up like as we evolve in that direction. Nicholas, if you have any thoughts from like the ground. Um, no, unfortunately. I focus on youth development, so after school, summer camp, more than the early childhood. I see, and maybe like other, different uh, other thoughts. Like we know that vouchers, like like uh, there are many issues tied to vouchers. But like when family get a voucher, they can use it in centers that are not contracted. They, they can use it with a family provider. They can use it with a informal care, like a neighbor care. So maybe the solution is like if the city is giving more money through vouchers, and then you are able to use it with someone that you know, someone who is willing to have your child from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m., but you also feel comfortable. So I feel like maybe there is some, uh, something on a voucher side that gives people technically money in hand. Uh, yeah, there's investment, Maria, to your point. I mean, more money is step one, right? There's just, there's more need than is funded to begin with. And there is never a one size fits all solution mm -hmm. when you're talking about right serving families and children. There's so many different scenarios. And so it has to start with an investment and seriousness. And then, you know, one of the things I'm 
I think Betty sort of referenced that I'm not hearing is the transportation piece. You know, who could get them from the school somewhere? You know, everything doesn't have to maybe go from, you know, 7 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. or whatever we're trying to do. So how are we connecting other, you know, pieces of this puzzle uh, as a city? <clears throat> so some thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say, like, when you mentioned the transportation, that can be an issue on its own. Like, we know that families are not always using childcare where they live. Maybe they are taking their child to where they are working, so which is like in Manhattan. So, like, how do we balance that? And, like, really, what is the accessibility issue that parents are experiencing just by using the care, like, in a, in a place that kind of is the most appropriate for them? Thank you. I, I also... Um... I'm concerned about, yes, we have to get the money and the programmatic aspects, but there has to be the piece on the quality because mm -hmm. you can give vouchers to people and they'll take someone to their neighbor or you know, someone that's, that's comfortable and close and culturally um, relevant. But if these are, these are public dollars, you know, as, as Dorothy alluded to, uh, we have to make sure that the walls don't have lead and that it isn't a fire hazard and that there are bars on the windows so kids don't fall out and a host of other um, physical matters, you know, that smoke alarms, et cetera, as well as some amount of training of the person. Yes, they're home based, Absolutely. They're going to be a certified teacher, but there has to be some instruction and some oversight. I think the state, I, if, I don't think I'm misspeaking, but Maria Alice, the state, you know, through licenses, you know, there, there are strict guidelines, there's training expectations, Betty, there's physical plant requirements, there's licensing usually for, I think if public dollars are going, there, right? right, you know, if public money is going, you probably need some sort of child care license with your Department of Health. There, there are uh, requirements uh, along. There the are, but, but yeah, um, I think on the on the voucher side, I want to say like we we kind of used to see more vouchers used in informal care like before, especially in communities that you can see there are like maybe two centers available and they are like maybe clustered in one side. We see really decline in voucher use for informal care for children under five. I think right now in twenty twenty there were like less than three thousand. Even two thousand eighteen, I feel like there was like over five thousand. Like there was like a decline a while back, uh, there were like more. So we do see decrease in vouchers used for children under five overall, which is a good sign that people are, that parents are you know, using different uh, settings. But I do think if there is an expansion or different thought around vouchers, there should be all these other elements, Betty, that you mentioned mm -hmm. about the quality, different standards, even for informal or the conditions, physical conditions. So. I'm, this is not my area of expertise <laughs> in that sense. So just take that with a grain of salt, obviously everything I said, uh, but I know that it is one avenue to kind of provide more support. Mm -hmm. And I, I apologize, I, um, I actually have to deal with my own child actually, um, and uh, do need to, to jump off here in the next minute. Um, but, um, you know, I'd want to want to say appreciation for for you all listening and excited to see what, you know uh, where you go with this. I hope we can stay in touch on that, and we're happy to share this presentation with you, um, and and hope it's helpful. And and I hope you use our our data as well to to sort of investigate other indicators that might be helpful to you in your uh, your district. Yeah, as Taya says, we're going to be stalking you. We'll be asking you some questions. Thank you very much. This was. Um, very uh, relevant, thoughtful, and inspiring us to our future work. So have a great rest of the evening and you will be hearing from us. Thank Thanks a lot. And Taya, Thank I will you. be in touch with, uh, with the slide deck. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Adam. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so to my committee, do you have any questions or additional thoughts about this? Um, well, we're, we just heard it, so it's, it's fresh in our mind in terms of how we're using some of this or future questions we'll ask to get to our district statement of needs. So maybe something we write will actually get there, so to speak. Yeah, I, 
I guess I'll jump in just um, in continuing to engage them in different ways. They've, they've got a wealth of data. It's all public, but they're, they're, you know, curating it for us, which is really excellent, right? Uh, to get, to get that is, is a big deal. Um, so I think we should just in general, keep them in mind as we think about statement of needs, which that was an awesome question, Betty. Um, and then just, even if we were thinking about who we wanted to see, what we wanted to do in future meetings, um, I think they're awesome. Good. So it sounds like we should just think about this, review the, um, the slide deck because there was so much information I think when we we get it in our inboxes and then have it as an area of discussion next month does that sound right so we could build on this anyone else okay okay so um the next part of our report our meeting will be um the other committee business. So I, I know we're very interested to hear from our youth council. So tell us what you're up to, what's on your mind and uh, how we can support your work. You guys can just go alphabetically. <laughs> okay, I'll start then. Um, my project proposal is to develop. Who a... is that? Because I don't have a full screen. So who's talking? Oh, sorry, this is Abby. Hi, Abby. Okay, yeah. Go on. Um, the first thing is I'll I'll describe the problem. So in our district, uh, we have uh, there's a major discrepancy between resources that um rich folks, rich students have, and poor students, uh, especially in terms of extracurriculars. Um. There, so, and that limits students in terms of their uh, job prospects, college prospects, um, and overall enrichment opportunities. Um, all of the youth council members all attend private schools and found out about, about this council through <laughs> enrichment opportunity coordinators. Um, and these are, that's a resource that public schools in this district do not have. Um, and thus those kids miss out on opportunities. Um, so my project is to develop a, uh, number one, to develop a database that has all kinds of enrichment opportunities for students from immersion programs to um, uh, test prep opportunities um, mm -hmm. and things like this, um, civic engagement, um, et cetera. And also to have this is this we don't we we don't have the authority for staffing budgets and neither does the city council as I found out but um, having some kind of of guidance counselor to to assist with with application processes and and telling students about opportunities that's definitely a lot harder given that we don't have the authority for that but having a us what Taya what and I were talking about is having um, a, 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 a student led um, effort to create this database um, and then having that being reinforced in schools by um, existing gu guidance counselors. This is very relevant and, and uh, thoughtful work. How would you engage how would you either engage or propose to engage uh, public school students in the district? So the first thing is assessing the needs of the individual schools. Um, there are like the, the the public schools in the district are not all the same. There's there are schools that pull pretty wealthy demographics and schools that pull less so. Um, and I think that so first seeing what individual schools need and then going into those schools and talking to students and talking to teachers and talking to administrators and seeing what really what work really needs to be done in those schools and what they already have in the way of those opportunities. So who would do this and what kind of access do you need? Um, so I think that as a student, I think I, I'm someone who can engage 
with other students. I think peer to peer effort is really important. I think um, I want I, I want I also want to be mindful of the position I hold as a like wealthy white student coming into these schools. I don't want to I don't want to act like I am I have I don't want to act like I'm in a, like an authority position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that's something I want to be mindful of. But um, I think this project requires uh, talking to people and like hearing what they need. So that's something that I, I that's where I think I can um, go into these schools and talk to people. Thank you. Are there questions from other committee members? Well, I'd, I'd like to gush first at what an amazing uh, project and idea that it is. Abby. That's so awesome. Um, <clears throat> really needed always in so much of the work of sort of filling in gaps is is a is live resources. Um, a just having that compiled, right? Um, you all probably have no. Well, you might know what yellow pages are, but you've never touched one. Um, you, you, you know, and it's even in this digital age, things aren't updated as easily as they could be, right? It's not a printed book, but it requires manpower. Uh, and there's also a lot of turnover, unfortunately, in a lot of these resources, maybe, um, too, right? So even though it, it exists, some of the work seems to be, you know, are they still around and when are they accessible? And you know, who can enroll and all that stuff. So um, I think it's amazing. I would offer a tip if maybe to, to hit the Department of Youth and Community Development website and locate where the after school programs are in our district and where the, I mean, Cornerstone, we could tell you, but that would be no fun for you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> where uh, the cornerstone programs are, and these are going to be after school programs. So you have public school students under those roof, you know, after school that maybe you could then have access to um, and young people talking to them. They and in youth development, which I do, um, what you're talking about is often called community mapping. Right, sort of like what's in the community there. And that's part of youth development work. So to have somebody like come in and say, hey, this is a project I'm in and I'd love to help. And I might like to mobilize, you know, excited students in your after school program to figure out what's there and what's needed and put something together. You'd also probably have, you know, like free, you know, free help <laughs> uh, and, and maybe a way to systematize it. So good luck, happy to answer any questions ever too and um, help. Thank you. Is any other uh, members of the committee uh, have questions for Abby? Because we want to then we'll go on to our next youth council member. So who's next? I'll go next. Hi, this is Ian. And my idea for my kind of project is essentially a action report to address homelessness, especially in Brooklyn. So I envision kind of a report to the committee presenting uh, some information, some research that I'm gonna compile. Um, so this research is gonna have a couple of fronts. The first prong is the current state of homelessness in New York City, Brooklyn, and if possible, this district in particular, because I think that's a really important, it's always an important issue, but uh, particularly after the COVID pandemic, the issue of homelessness is really elevated. So. Uh, my second, the second part I want to do is to see what currently exists, what current resources are there in New York City or in Brooklyn to address homelessness. And thirdly, I want to also do some research about what works elsewhere. Are there initiatives, are there programs in other cities of comparable size, like San Francisco or Washington, D.C., that have worked and have demonstrated actual effective um, help in the, to, to help the, help the homeless? And lastly, what I want to do is like I said before, to give a report to the committee and to request funding for some specific initiative for this district. That's it. Awesome. Did you go to another committee, like uh, the HES committee, which deals with health, environment, and social service, which I think in our structure, every community district board has different committees, you know, they have different names, but we all have to address you know, these issues. So that might be interesting to 
go to that committee. And Taya, do you want it, are there other committees that maybe Ian could go to to uh, hear some discussion and maybe connect with some members that are very passionate about this? Yeah, I'm actually just taking a note for Ian to review the Hess Committee YouTube archive. Um, and also in the, because all of the committee agendas and minutes are in our public drive, you could do a Google search in the, you could Google search the drive for keywords like um, homelessness, um, unhoused, et cetera. And that should pull up a list of all of the specific Hess meetings where that topic was addressed. And then you could just look for that YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Thanks. I have a question for Ian. Yep. I would really like to know what made you choose this particular topic, homelessness? Well, I guess my, my particular train of thought for choosing this topic wasn't that sophisticated. It was essentially, <laughs> I thought of, you know, what are the biggest problems that I see when I walk around, you know, New York, Brooklyn, this area. And all I could think about is essentially really homelessness because it's such a visible thing. It's always around us. So I think, and to walk past a homeless person kind of, it always brings forth a feeling of, you know, I should do more about this. This is an issue that can be addressed. So I want to really do my best to kind of address this issue. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was just interested because as a young person, I just wanted to know what made you key in on that. Mm -hmm. We all see it, but not everyone wants to take that on because it's um, it's a little difficult, but it's but there are strides that can be taken. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. I have um, just, I, I think it's like, yeah, really awesome uh, project for you. Uh, I, I have a suggestion. I mean, take it or leave it, you know, whatever, mull it over. Uh, one of our city council people, uh, Lincoln Ressler, who's this new city council person for District 33, which is co just you know, it's, it's in our district. He is taking one of the leads in our community uh, because there are going to be four new homeless shelters for uh, men um, in our community district, and uh, they're in various stages of construction and staffing and community engagement and all the things that go into uh, shelters. So maybe someone on uh, council member restless staff can give you some insight uh, into this as it plays out very locally in, in our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'll don't definitely. have to listen to me. I mean, it's, it's no, no, just- no, no, that's a good <laughs> idea. I'll definitely do it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And who is next? Uh, me. Um, so prior to really going into topics- that Give I us want... your name. Oh, sorry. My name is Maddie. Um, Hi, Maddie. Yeah. Hi. So prior to really going into a topic, um, NYCHA housing was a really big topic for me because uh, I personally connect with it. Um, but after going attending a HES committee meeting, um, homelessness was also a topic I was considering and maternal mortality disparities was also a topic that I was really interested in, but I decided to go back to focusing more on NYCHA housing um, as my general topic. Um, I believe that affordable housing should make you feel secure and safe, at, but NYCHA housing falls short of its promises. Um, there are many problems in the NYCHA housing systems there's a lack of care and sometimes um a lack of sanitary sanitary uh, necessity and there's basic utilities that are um lacking sometimes like hot water or even heating and there's also a lot of safety issues um and nonprofit resources are scattered and difficult to navigate um and in niger housing i wanted to particularly focus on youth because i feel like NYCHA youth, especially being a child that lives in a NYCHA housing in Brooklyn during the school week um, with my grandmother, um, often we can't, not say we can't, but it's sometimes hard to build discussion around issues that we face in our housing areas. 
Um, and there's a feeling that we have to settle for what we're given. However, that's not the case. So my project is more about creating a type of educational outreach for youth in NYCHA housings um, and possibly creating a resource that they can eventually advocate for their needs um, and feel like they're being heard in their housing areas. Um, and so my next step for this project is to research um, the four Brooklyn Council District 2 NYCHA complexes and contact their tenant associations um, and ask for contacts to their youth groups or organizations that are working with youth to figure out what is missing. And that's my project. That's awesome. I wanna ask Nick, is the cornerstone or the beacon, which of those um, has lots of kids uh, who, who live in the developments? Yeah, great question. So um, the world is in great hands with all of you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm yeah, so happy really. today after, oh, it's been a rough few, uh, few weeks, so thank you. Um, cornerstones literally are within a NYCHA uh, facility, Maddie, so they're contracts from the city to offer, if you're not familiar, programming for five years old through, you know, 500 if, if you're lucky or unlucky enough to be that old. Um, and so liter that'll be literally in NYCHA, but um, you might, same, same deal if you're interested in connecting with youth, um, I would go on DYCD because um, Beacon programs as well both the Cornerstone program and the Beacon program are expected to have youth councils already. So you've got built in sort of youth leadership and oftentimes for lots of reasons, um, I think those groups would be very much excited about having an external person who has a project who wants to engage them and lead that crew in something meaningful. Uh, they, they would love that. So I, I would connect um, to them as well. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you as well. Um, offline. Excellent. Um, are there any other committee members who have a question or comment or support for Maddie and her, her project? I, I mean, I personally want to thank you, Maddie, because I too grew up in NYCHA development. Um, and this is, I still to this day am very vocal about the resource, the lack of resources um, that in particular Red Hook, um, because it's still dear to my heart. And I thank you. I mean, you all, I mean, I'm just sitting here like in amazement listening to all of you because, um, you know, it, it's wonderful, your ideas and, you know, however we can support you, we are here. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, anyone else for any final comments from Maddie or Ian or Abby? Leverage us all, please bother us all. We um, have a lot of experience. We have a lot of contacts and networks, we, but we're all busy. So just keep harassing us. You have youth and excitement and passion on your side. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and you're connected to, you know, in theory, a body that could move your work forward. Um, so super exciting and, and big thank you to Taya and Betty. Um, I think if this was the genesis of the youth board because it's phenomenal start. Okay, thank you. So we're going to hear from you often and hopefully in between our meetings. You know, I know for myself, you can text me or email me and Taya, you know, has all the information of our Contacts. Okay. Um, I would like to do a very brief chairs report. Um, I want to remind the members of the special meeting tomorrow night at Bishop Lachlan in person. The first time we'll see each other in two years. Uh, yeah. And we also heard from the governor that she extended the remote meetings until at least until April 15th. Uh, and I feel that there's been a lot more engagement in our committee somewhat, but in some of the other committees, really a lot with having people being able to meet on Zoom and, and connect. So we hope that there's, uh, I know that 
there's some advocacy amongst the different uh, boards to uh, the, the governor's office and other electeds that at least we'd be able to have some type of hybrid so that if our goal is civic engagement and hearing people's voices, uh, this Zoom and WebEx situation has actually been helpful. Um, what else do I want to say? In April, in our April meeting, Samantha Late, I think is how we say her name, she will be giving a report. She's one, uh, a fellow that did some research. Uh, she spoke to the board a few months ago. She was doing research about schools and about um, health and uh, mortality, uh, maternal mortality. And she was really looking at disparities as we've always been talking about between the wealthier and poorer parts of our district and seeing what we could come up with. Uh, so that'll be interesting to hear what she's learned in her study. But I wanna put a bug in everyone's head that next year when it rolls around that there'll be a planning fellow we should already have something in, in writing or in, at the tip of our tongue that we could say, we would like a fellow to research this component, this X, Y, or Z. And I think the more explicit we can be, the better report we can get. So I hope people um, think about that. Um, let's see what else. There was an officer that, came by, I, I saw him on the chat, and then I believe he left. He's in uh, Daniel Augusta. He's an NYPD officer for community affairs and youth coordination for area three in the police department. Now, I'm not sure what area three is, if that's our community district or just one of our precincts, but I know over the years we've talked about the way that the uh, NYPD engages with young people, uh, and, and some of the issues, you know, both positive and negative. Uh, and we know that the mayor is very interested in, uh, you know, better outcomes, shall we say. So I hope he comes again. Did he come back, Taya? Did he leave a note? No, but I think he'll be back another month. Um... PSA3 has actually been really communicative lately. So I think they're interested in attending more and sort of different committees to talk about different topics. Yeah. They, they do a lot more than just the public safety aspect. They, they traditionally only speak to the transportation and public safety committee, but they do actually have quite a bit of community outreach um, activity as well. And I think I, I get the sense that they would like to speak about that more. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. When I worked in schools, um, they were often in schools. They knew certain young people. They engaged um, uh, kids in some of their sports activities and so on. And sometimes some of them were really good in helping mediate between a kid and a school or a kid and a parent and, you know, within the context of the school. So I think that's um, a positive that uh, the Community Affairs Youth Coordination uh, officer will come to our committee occasionally. So that's uh, let me just say that if he comes again, I think maybe we should acknowledge him and then ask if he's gonna, if he would like to stay, you know, to say a few words, because maybe he, the presentation was quite lengthy. He probably had to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yes, sure I he wanted to say something. <laughs> Dorothy, you're, we're totally aligned. I actually invited him next time if he'd like oh. to be on the agenda. <laughs> okay, all right. Excellent. I think it was it, it was longer than expected. I mean, that's good. It means that we were interested, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think he had to go. Okay, thank you. Can we, Great. Can we make sure, I'm, I'm really, I don't know how to word this nicely, um, but can we make sure whoever comes is able to handle basic questions from the group and not get offended I know that, uh, sorry to call you out, but Cynthia and I years ago, literally were like, apparently we, you know, we asked one question and, and it was framed as though we were, you know, we attacked 
you know, the police or something, you know, with a question. And the question just for the group was, do you have training specific to how you would engage adolescents versus how you might engage a grown adult? Um, and this was in response to them clearing the Brooklyn Bridge Park years ago and, and all the results of that one is overcrowded. And apparently that was a devastatingly painful question for them and we were setting them up and making them look foolish and whatever. So I, I just I don't do have, think, you know, I need some thick no, skin I, here. I, you I know I got to be real when they come here. I hear you. I think all of our city agency partners, um, you know, it's, it's, it's anxiety producing or causing, what's the word I'm looking for? It's stressful for them to come and speak to the community board as well, because I know that sometimes they are not sure what they're coming into. Um, I think that the it's a lot better when we can give them some advanced notes about what we're curious about. So for example, Nick, if that's a topic that you're specifically interested in, I think we should send that to them in advance so that just to give them the opportunity to be prepared to really address it comfortably. Yeah. And, I, and I, not, um, not, so, not sure. to give them time to spin it, no, but just, no, just no, so no. that they're, you know, so that they're yeah. prepared. And, and even in the context of the community, because they've got this, the, the, you know, the community sort of division and then you've got, you know, everybody else. Right. So even a follow-up question would be, you know, or is there even a leveraging of sort of that, those, that department, those officers to maybe train the other officers? Because I've only had positive experiences with the community officers. They seem to love youth and that's why, you yeah. know, they're, they're literally doing that. Um, so, I definitely know. get the impression that a lot of the officers assigned to that unit never had any intention or any desire to be street beat cops. Like that was their very specific area of interest. Um, I would say that anytime an agenda is published, that's a great time to go and check out the website that's linked. I always try to get a website. And then in that week between when the agenda is announced and when they show up, um, please feel free to email any specific questions over because even I mean, even if they have a couple hours notice, this is what they do every day. So it's not like they need a lot of advance time. It's just helpful for them to know, like, what should I expect? I do have a question. Are you saying that we have to, they're going to vet out questions and that nothing, we can't um, deviate from anything that is sent? Because I don't no, necessarily no, no. agree with always sending in our questions because some, they may say something, then I may want to um, dig in a little further. I, I mean, I'm just a little, still a little baffled by it being labeled as being aggressive back then. And um, I just feel that I should be able to freely ask any question um, as long it's within the subject matter. Um, and we, it was, I mean, there, there was an, a, a great concern of what had transpired and he was the uh, commanding officer in charge and he should have been able to answer the questions. I don't think anyone was aggressive. So I, I don't always agree that, um, I don't really like always having to send in questions ahead of time. So um, I just wanted to voice that. I'm just, in a, I, I totally hear you Cynthia. And an example that's maybe less controversial would be like tonight, I know that there were, Betty had like three other topics that she was hoping that the speaker would touch on tonight, but they just didn't have the data available. You know, that happens actually a lot in the Transportation and Public Safety Committee a lot as well. DOT will come and questions come up in the moment. And it's not that the DOT is being obstructive and doesn't want to answer. They just literally don't have access to the data in front of them at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's okay to say that, and you know, right. you know, but we'll get back to you, you know, or something to that sort, because that has been done. You know, we don't have it readily available, but we'll send it to the community board, and then it'll be disseminated amongst us. I also get the impression, at least in my two plus years, that there isn't a, a real tradition of having the various NYPD divisions come to the community board. So maybe this is a good opportunity for a fresh start and to, you know, for, I, I always tell the city agencies, an invitation to a committee is just an invitation to meet your neighbors, right? Like this, we, we could have a fresh start and maybe make some new relationships because there's always turnover in those agencies too. So I, I think that the folks that would be coming here would be new. And I don't think you guys are aggressive. 
You're excited sometimes. <laughs> Listen, I, we're passionate. We were being yes, we're passionate. We, we were being, <laughs> I, I know when I could be labeled aggressive. They just didn't like the question because they didn't have an answer. We are free to ask any questions That's that right. we choose That's to right. ask. And if someone does not want to answer or cannot answer, then they should say, I'm sorry, but I don't have that information. If they get offended, then that's on them. We can well ask what we choose to ask. Well said. Okay, so um, before we go to new business and then adjournment, I just wanted to bring up the issue once again, just so you have it in the back of your mind about District 13, new elementary school coming on board. That's the one in that Alby Square area. Uh, that school will come on, not this September, but the following September. But that means that there's a lot of planning that goes into a lot of all the aspects of the school from you know, hiring, curriculum, et cetera. But we're interested in zoning because like who, we saw that whole development of that downtown Brooklyn area and who gets to go to the school within the context of the whole district and within the context of the district needs. So it's something to think about. And if, if you remember a bunch of years ago when we had the PS8 and PS307 meetings about zoning and, and, and we were able to write letters and, and weigh into that, um, this will be an important issue to follow. I mean, nothing has come out yet, but it's, it's going to. This may be off topic, but how do we know how Dock Street is doing and what the uh, demographics is of that school? Yeah, I could find out. So um, like a summary of who's going there, the demographics, and I guess the student outcomes, right? Yes. Okay, I could look stuff up and maybe get it to you all. I, I could do that, I think. And, um, and then if we want to follow up on that, we could. Um, yeah, I, I hear it's doing fine. I mean, initially it was more of the kids were from the satellite school, you know, local. And I think as they're re-envisioning middle school enrollment, you know, throughout the district, it will be interesting to see how the enrollment patterns respond because in, in an additional year, there'll be a new middle school in Atlantic Yards. So will that mm -hmm. the patterns of where young people's parents choose to go, so. Uh, and it's gonna be also interesting too now, once the, uh, condominiums open up at the new library, um, you know, because I believe some of their, their go up to about five bedrooms. So I'm so I would assume that there will be a lot of families there. Um, I do see a lot of people um, taking the train to come to PS8 as well. So I know there are a lot of students outside of the neighborhood that are attending PS8. Whether well, that's, that's on the record or, or not, I don't know. But um, I thought that was interesting to see as well. A lot of parents taking the trains to bring their, their children over here. Hmm. And especially as it, we hear it's getting more overcrowded uh, as people are returning, that, that's interesting if they don't really, yeah, because you wouldn't be taking a subway there from that zone. Yeah, yeah I, I have a related question, and I don't even know what the question is. I guess it's just a larger investigation of the issue, which we we talked about many years ago of even understanding if there's a need for increased middle schools based on all of the, you know, housing in downtown. Um, you know, what what are these families doing? You know, are they are they starting their family? Are they staying here while their young ones are in elementary? And then, you know, moving somewhere else, greener, you know, bigger, um, or they may be waiting till high school. That's some data I've, I've gotten in other neighborhoods that uh, that was really more immigrant centric, that they were willing to do the public school system through middle school. And then the goal is to get out for high school of the city. 
Um, but I think that's important for us because we, you know, we, I don't think we should be advocating again, just for middle schools if we don't need them when we have tons of vacant seats in other middle schools, um, you know, but that aren't, I guess, just opening up for these new wealthy, um, you know, folks. Mm. And let's face it, the price points are, you know, you, you, you gotta be wealthy uh, to live in these new builds. Extremely wealthy, not just Extremely wealthy, wealthy yes. Okay. Or, or single and, you know, no kids like me. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna, uh, building on what Nick said, Atea, if you could contact the office, the DOE has an office of school planning that really mines demographic, era, uh, demographic data uh, and they have statistics on how many people have moved into certain areas, have left certain areas, what the, um, the demographics look like in terms of birth year cohorts. You know, some years there aren't as many children born as other years, uh, et cetera. So I, I think I, I, I think I would like to hear from the Office of School Planning. Uh, in relation to our district, but in relation to the demographics in the district. And that they have loads of information and I hope that they feel comfortable sharing it. I don't see Taya on the thing. You got a thumbs up. I got a thumbs up, thank you. you. Yes, up. I hear you, sorry. No. I'm just look, looking them up. Phone. I'm not on the iPad, so that's why I don't see the whole gallery view and I'm struggling a little bit. Okay, so under the kind of, that was kind of new business. Um, is there any more uh, further business? If not, I'll hear a motion to adjourn. What time is it? It is oh, 7.48. So is there so a motion? Moved. Great, and I hope to see everyone tomorrow. I don't, I don't know if I'll recognize you outside of your squares. You know, everyone, we've <laughs> been seeing each other in our squares. Uh, oh. But yeah, <laughs> Jason shrugged. No, anyway. It's funny that you type that because I think that is one of the things you don't, you have no concept of, right? <laughs> so uh, I look forward to seeing everyone. And uh, I won't recognize you because I think a lot of us will be wearing masks, but uh, whatever. You'll the recognize me. Just look for the blonde hair if I'm there. <laughs> Do well. Have a good evening, everyone. And I can right. say honestly, see you tomorrow. All right. Bye now.